Good morning everybody, welcome. Welcome to Redland Church Online. My name is Will. If I haven't met you before, I'm Vicar of Redland and it's so good to have you all with us as we worship together this morning. And just a few quick things that we'd love to just tell you about before we kind of begin together in worship. And David, um, who's uh, part of the team here, is going to kind of lead us into that in just a second. But first off, um, so we have coming up this Wednesday, um, date for your diaries if you haven't got it already, we've um, put this on our email, but we have um, our next prayer meeting. For the next season, we're making these monthly. They're going to be at 7.30. They're going to be sort of um, less than an hour. Um, so you kind of know uh, how much time you, you, know, you need to set aside for it. 7.30 in the evening, our prayer meeting. Like we really do genuinely believe that if we're going to see transformation, it's because Jesus has turned up and done something. And he invites us to partner with him in praying and seeking him and seeking his will for this, this world and this church. And we want this church to be built on a foundation of prayer, of seeking him for the renewal of all things. And so we'd love, if you're around, for you to join us on that. Link is on our email. Again, if you're not getting our emails, do in the video description, click the link and sign up so you don't have to miss out. Next, we're really excited today. Um, we're gonna be starting a new short mini series, mini sermon series on race. After that, we're gonna be doing a slightly longer series on Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, but we're gonna be doing a two week mini series on race. Brit is going to be starting that today and I'm going to be concluding it next week. You know, this last year has seen a, like, an incredible kind of movement with the, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, the stuff following uh, the death of George Floyd in America. This incredible movement bringing to our attention the issues of racial injustice in our world and in our society. And there's so much chatter about it all. Um, and we kind of want to just uh, begin to ask the question, well, you know, what might that mean for us? And, and what does the way of Jesus have to say into that? Now, I'm conscious it's two weeks. Um, I don't profess to be an expert. I don't think any of us particularly are. We are fumbling around a bit in the darkness, but I don't think that that is a good enough reason for us to not tackle this. I hope that this two-week series, it's not gonna sort it, it's not going to answer every question, and if you're looking for it to do that, you're going to be disappointed. But what I hope it will do is provoke, question, and, um, and kind of begin a conversation that will be ongoing, I'm sure, for many years. And I hope it will put questions in your heart that will allow Jesus to speak to you about stuff that's going on within you and stuff that's going on in the world that you, know, you find yourself in uniquely. Um, and I hope that he will use this to bring in your life and in my life and in the life of our church, transformation in this area. So really excited about that. I'm sure it's gonna be a bit uncomfortable, but that's okay. That's often the realities of following Jesus. It's not always easy, it's not always comfortable. You might disagree with things, that's okay. Use that to drive you towards listening to what Jesus is saying to you. Lastly, um, it's Lent starting kind of this week. And um, Lent is a period of kind of preparation as we look forward to the amazing like death and resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate at Easter. And as part of that, we want to um, kind of use it as, as an opportunity for us to just go a bit deeper with Jesus. We, you know, one of our things as a church is that we want to go deeper. And so what we're doing is we're recommending a book. I've got it here. It's a really good book. It's called The Deeply Formed Life by a guy called Rich Villadas who is a pastor in the States, and I have read it recently, and I think it is awesome. You can buy it at Amazon or other reputable bookstores, um, but it's an incredible book, and what I love about it is it's a book that merges the kind of like theoretical of, oh, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus, with the practical, like everything he does, he follows up with a practical chapter on how we might live this out, or how we might see it kind of come to fruition in our life. I'll just read this section on the back, because I just think, it, you know, it speaks to my heart and it makes me think, yes, I needed to read this. Um, I need to read it again because I've still not grasped it. But he says, um, most believers live in this state of being a Christian without ever being deeply formed by Christ. Our pace is too frenetic to be in union with God. And we don't know how to quiet our hearts and minds to be present. Our emotions are unhealthy and not compartmentalized. We are lost when faced with reconciling our Christian beliefs and the complexities of race, sexuality, and justice. 
we feel unable to love well or live differently from the rest of the world to live as people of the good news. If you're someone who thinks I haven't, I just feel stuck with how it is I could grow in my faith. I just feel a bit stuck of how we can live in this world of increasing chaos, of racial injustice, of you know, like so many different kind of life scripts going on about how we live, you know, sexually. Like this book is for you. It speaks into every issue, from our own personal formation to issues of justice, and it is deeply practical. I would love for you to join us in reading it together. So get yourself a copy. It's available on Kindle as well, um, and join with us in this next season as we read together. I'm going to hand over to David now, who's just going to lead us as we come to worship God together. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little sick of my own four walls. So I thought I'd give a bit of change of scenery today. I'm in front of um, the college where I'm studying at the moment. Um, And I want to invite us together as we worship together in this scattered way that we, we need to sometimes change the scenery of our own hearts. And instead of just looking at the world around us, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus so that we see the world as he sees it and he, as he longs it to be. So why don't you just set aside what you're doing and, and maybe what you're thinking about and fix your eyes on him. I'm going to read a bit from Psalm 89. It says this. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make known your faith make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. You have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. And later it says this Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. So Father, we thank you that we can approach your throne with boldness. Thank you that you welcome us in, that you love us, and that you alone transform what's broken. So come and encounter us now, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yours is the name above all names. 
What a powerful name it is Nothing can stand again What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is Church. Good morning, Redland Church family. But I said it once and I'll say it again. It is good to be at church this morning. And even though we're in separate spaces and places, we're still one church worshiping God together. I know it doesn't always feel like quite the same right now, um, but I always just try to remember when I'm frustrated, sad, uh, just kind of missing my life my normal life before COVID that like God is still sovereign in all of this in everything he is still sovereign he's not surprised by any of this he's not shook uh he reigns still and he is using this time in ways that I don't even think we can fully comprehend or understand yet but our hope is in him my hope my trust my allegiance it isn't in like Boris or the government or politicians. My hope is in Jesus and I rest in Jesus and I delight in Jesus. That's, that's not even what today's sermon's about. It was like a pre-sermon. The, the, extra, <laughs> the extra sermon nobody asked for. <laughs> there you go. There you go. God is sovereign still. Yeah, let's get into the real sermon because once again, I'm a talker and they don't give me enough time to do all my talking. So first of all, I just wanted to say, y'all, I'm feeling like blessed, honored that I get to speak this morning. Let's dive right into this thing. So we are starting this like new mini two week sermon series on racial discrimination and faith. And a hush falls over the room. If we were in person, it would just be like a 
uncomfortable faces looking back at me. <laughs> because y'all, I feel like it's a very uncomfortable conversation. Um, at least I think it is whenever we talk about, I don't know, race or any of these things. I get quite uncomfortable when I'm talking about it. And I remember even when Will asked me if I'd like to speak during the sermon series and partner alongside of him in this ser in this series, I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Definitely, like, I'm totally up for this. Let's do it. But then also a very real other side of me was kind of like, oh. <laughs> almost like a bit apprehensive or uncomfortable to speak about these things. And we, and we live in this age of political correctness where like, we are very mindful of what we say to each other and we're super conscious of like using the right words, not trying to offend people and that kind of stuff. Which is really good because we don't want to be saying super offensive things to people or hurt people's feelings or just be really insensitive. But the flip side of that sometimes is sometimes supreme political correctness can make us feel scared or timid to like talk about things because we're so scared we might say the wrong thing or not word it quite the right way. Now, as well, before we get into it, I just wanted to start here by saying I can't cover everything that we need to talk about in a 20 minute sermon, <laughs> but I can share some of my honest convictions about racism in our world and what I think God wants to say to us about it. So after the very public murder of George Floyd, it sparked this like whole global conversation. Well, it's saying it sparked a global conversation. It actually sparked much more than a conversation. It sparked protests and action, even here in our city. We had a certain statue torn down by young protesters, didn't we? And that made people feel like all kinds of different ways. Like some people were like, oh, like this is criminal behavior. People are trying to take away our history when actually this is a very real part of our history. And other people were kind of saying, you know, we didn't really like this thing. We didn't want to walk by the statue every day. I didn't want my black and ethnic minority friends to walk by the statue every day. It needed to go. And there was these kind of like two different perspectives going on. Um, regardless of how you felt about it or what you thought, it doesn't really matter. But my lovely, wonderful, fantastic friend, Alan Barr, said something that I thought was really interesting. Uh, and really stuck with me. He said, regardless of what you think about it, he was just like so in awe to see how much young people like actually cared about something. Or at least like actually cared about something enough to be moved into action. Not like writing a Facebook post or like, I don't know, <laughs> just getting really mad about it, but actually being moved to do something, action and protest. And for far too long, we've allowed racism to fester and exist in our world. For far too long, we have all known racism is alive and present here in our country. Or maybe it's just me, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of you, but at least I've known. It's very alive and present, not only here, but my country as well, in Canada and North America. But I think most of us already knew, to some degree, that life is harder in Britain for ethnic minorities. Like, I feel like I've known this now for like a decade. And I'm 28, so a decade's a very long time for me still. <laughs> I've known for over a decade that my black friends have a much harder go at things than I do. I've known that they get stopped and searched by police far more often than I do. I, I've known that my Muslim friends receive horrible hate slurs and threats. I felt sick when an airplane carried the words white lives matter over a football match and the lack of empathy we gave things like Grenfell Tower um, when it caught on fire and 72 people died in comparison to when something like Notre Dame caught on fire. I've known now for a good long while that something isn't right <laughs> in our world. Something is not right. But I've also just thought for such a long time like I'm not a racist, like, I'm not doing any of these things. Well, I have friends from every different race, I treat everyone the same, so like, I'm sorry this is happening, but I'm not the problem. And I kind of just like left it there and just hoped it would sort itself out and just enough nice people would surface and 
it would just kind of disappear. <laughs> And you know, I've been doing my best since the murder of George Floyd just to get myself a little bit more educated, to speak with like my ethnic minority friends, to read black writers, Muslim writers, American writers, people who I agree with, people who I disagree with. Like I've been trying, y'all. And the more I read and the more I seek God, the more it became apparent to me that to continue to say nothing about it and just hope it goes away actually doesn't really fit in with my Christian convictions. And the Bible actually has quite a lot to say on race, injustice, inequality. And perhaps it's not enough for me to continue to preach the same sermons out of like Paul's letter and then just be like, be nicer humans. Jesus wasn't afraid to get messy. Like our Bibles don't shy away from these topics. So neither should we. Injustice, inequality is like woven throughout the scriptures and it's a part of like who our God is. In Exodus, we learn our God is the God of the underdogs, the God of the slaves. He's the deliverer of his people. In Jonah, we see God judge a really racist Israelite who doesn't want God's love, mercy, compassion to extend to his enemies. So he runs from God. In Jeremiah, we have Abed Melech. I tried to say it really authentically. Ebed Melech. I don't know. <laughs> we have someone named Ebed Melech who's a Kushite, which would be someone who's a black African living at the south of the Nile who confronts King Zedekiah, who was ununiquely a bad king. But the Kushite man obtains permission from Zedekiah to rescue Jeremiah, the prophet we read about. We have Jesus and his radical inclusion of women like lower class men he tells the rich that they aren't the blessed ones actually it's the poor who are the blessed ones he tells controversial stories about good samaritans and he commands us to go into all the nations making disciples and he preaches this radical message about the kingdom of god and at the day of pentecost people from all nations were there we've got like parthians me medes Me Oh, I got some hard words. I'm gonna get in real close. <laughs> Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Pontus, Asia, Egypt, Libya, Roman, Cretans, Arabs. And the Spirit speaks to all of them in their own native tongues. And one of the biggest themes in our New Testaments is Gentile inclusion. And yet, we've somehow become so exclusive. How is it possible that Bristol, our city, is 28% ethnic minority, but our church does not reflect that at all. Y'all know me, I'm a Southside girl. <laughs> I live in South Bristol, I love it. I've been living in South Bristol, like blimey, like five years now. Um, and it's so funny, because if you come to my local pub, you're gonna bump into all different walks of life. You are gonna meet Langboy from Gambia. You're gonna meet Oxley from Tobago. Brittany, the Canadian. James, the Yorkshire sailor. Uh, we've got lawyers, we've got headhunters. We've got Spanish people, Greek people, Latinos. We've got ladies in saris, like Africans, Asians, people from the Caribbean. And I remember distinctly my very first Sunday at Redland, Redland Parish. And I remember, I was so nervous and well, kind of excited, but mostly nervous. And I arrived late uh, because I got lost. <laughs> I 100% parked in the tennis club parking lot as well. Sorry. And I remember being shocked to see how many white people were in one room. <laughs> like, I don't think I'd been in years in a room that was like 99.8% white people. <laughs> And I guess I'd never really taken stock of just like how culturally diverse Totterdown is until I came to our church. But as I've been talking to some of my ethnic minority friends, specifically more like my black friends and my mixed race friends, um, there's this theme that keeps coming up, something called microaggression, which is a new term for me. I don't know if it's a new term for you, but my friend Doug told me, he said, I think we all know the obvious things and condemn the obvious things. None of us are okay when we hear the N word or hear a racial slur. None of us are okay with racial profiling and black people being killed by police, pulled over more by the police. But there's actually so many of these microaggressions that we see. These racist thoughts and ideas that people have, but they're ever so subtle, but they're accepted. 
the face people pull when you say you live in Lawrence Hill or like the south side of Bristol and they're like <laughs> people asking me how I got my job and if it's because they needed to fill a quota or asking me where I was born and when I say Bristol they continue to ask me no 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 but where are you actually from my friend Doug went on to say as well, this is gonna sound crazy, Brett, but I'm honestly self-conscious about eating watermelon in front of white people or running late because of the idea is that black people are never on time. I overthink almost everything I do and how I will be perceived and what microaggressions are awaiting. And for me, when I was talking to him and when I heard these things, it like, punched me in the gut. First of all, how exhausting it must be to be worried about all these things that I'm never particularly worried about. And then I also felt punched in the gut with some mistakes I've made and some of those little seeds that are in my brain. It made me quickly realize perhaps none of us say the n-word, but maybe we do have seeds of racism somewhere within us that come out in little ways. I've seen it in my friends when they immortalize like the good old days of empire. Back when we were conquering the world and there was cultural genocide. I've seen my friends like subtly, just ever so subtly, kind of belittle people from Eastern Europe to make themselves feel bigger. Even when I tell people I'm an immigrant, sometimes they'll look at me confused. Like they can't wrap their heads around the fact that I'm an immigrant. <laughs> Someone once even argued with me. They're like, you're not an immigrant, you're white and you're from Canada. As if white people don't qualify as immigrants. <laughs> or Canadians. <laughs> so many of us have like these little seeds of racism embedded in us from our culture. The way we see ethnic minorities portrayed on television and in movies. The remnants and echoes of empire. It wasn't that long ago, actually in some of our lifetimes of people who are watching this that the Empire Windrush arrived in Britain with Caribbean immigrants who were met with great hostility. And let's just say as well, Windrush was happening in like, what I think some of us think of as like the golden era of Christianity. How have we so misunderstood Jesus? The words of scripture. How have we so misunderstood each other? If you guys wanna open up your Bibles, we're gonna be reading 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 to 21 and it says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from god everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god whoever does not love does not know god because god is love this is how god showed his love among us he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he is in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior to the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made in perfect love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We cannot love our brothers and sisters and be okay when they receive less in this world. We cannot love our brothers and sisters by allowing microaggressions to exist. I think so many of us have known for such a long time that ethnic minorities aren't treated the same as white people are. But are we actually loving people by showing them apathy and shrugging our shoulders and not having a conversation about it and just being like, well, 
the way of the world, you know, but I'm nice to you, so that's good enough, isn't it? One John uses pretty strong language when he says, whoever does not love their brother or sister cannot love God. I don't know, makes me feel like perhaps I've been a bit of a liar, or maybe my faith has been all about me. <laughs> the fact that I can come to church week after week after week, teaching our youth theology, and that God loves them, and that he wants to walk with them, be near with them. I think I've done a pretty major disservice to them by not addressing these racial problems we see in our world. I can't be teaching the Bible and not teach what it says about race because it's a massive theme in our New Testaments. And in Christ, we've been created into a new family, a new people. He is the new Adam and he has crushed the head of the serpent. In him, we are a new humanity, a new family. Galatians 3.28 reminds us that we've all been baptized into Christ and there's no Jew nor Greek, there's no slave nor free, there's no male, female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong in Christ, then you are from Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ephesians is one of my all-time favorite books in the Bible, mostly because it's small. <laughs> And I feel quite accomplished when I can read through a whole book quite quickly. But the central theme in Ephesians is about how Jesus is in the business of making all things new. And Ephesians 2 and 3 is about the new family we enter into when we follow Christ. When we follow Christ, we're no longer marked by the same old things we used to be marked by. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 12 to 16, Paul says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. So y'all aren't Gentiles anymore, is what Paul is saying. Remember, you who were separated from Christ and excluded from citizenship, so this is the great news. You've been brought into the family of God, and you are something new in the family of God. You're not a Gentile anymore. You're something new. But here's the rub. Jews, you're not what you used to be anymore either. I know it was great. It was really cool when you guys were like the only ones who were God's people. <laughs> but it's not an exclusive membership anymore. You're not Jews anymore. It's not that the Gentiles have become Jews. It's that through Jesus, he's made a new humanity. And it's not gonna look the same. It's not gonna mean the same thing anymore. You were something new in the family of God. Paul writes that Jesus Christ is our peace, who has made these two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. That's such a beautiful picture, isn't it? I always love that picture. It's a picture of the kingdom of God and what happens when we transform and conform to the ways of the spirit. But that's not the picture we see in our worlds and in our church, is it? And for Christ followers, we can't just sit down and be okay with this. <laughs> I know sometimes for me, when I hear about Black Lives Matter and then some people are shouting, no, White Lives Matter or All Lives Matter back at those people. I know sometimes for me as a Christian, I'm kind of like, well, wait, like, hold on. So my core conviction will be what the Bible tells me. And the Bible tells me there's no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We are something new, we're a new creation. Why are we spending so much time and energy identifying each other on these old systems? You're that color and you're this color. <laughs> and I think for a lot of us, our solution has been, well, I'm just gonna be colorblind. Jesus doesn't see color, so neither will I. Do y'all ever think like that? I know I used to, especially when I was a bit younger, and just say, well, I don't see race, I don't see color, I treat all people the same. And I think hopefully that's gonna end up where we are one day as we journey more and more into what racism is and into its effects on our world and as we pray for God's kingdom to come. But we will never get to that spot if we don't recognize and dismantle the systematic oppression that some people face 
and live with in our world. We can't just say, well, <laughs> I'm colorblind. I don't see race. Race doesn't matter to me. I love everyone. And then continue to turn a blind eye to like a system that favors some. Does that make sense? In order for us to get to a place of reconciliation, we need to take some time to reflect and examine our own actions and inactions. We need to examine our own hearts and some of the microaggressions we see within us. We need to educate ourselves, read ethnic minority writers, people who can speak from different viewpoints than we necessarily understand or live in. We need to listen. We need to identify inequalities in our system and in our world and eliminate them. And we need, we need a whole lot of Holy Spirit. We are not loving our neighbors. We are not loving God's people by not having these conversations and by allowing them to just exist and just kind of say, oh, that's the way of the world. I think it's easier to do that. And I know that's why I've done it for a really long time. But it's a really big conviction for me right now that that can't be okay for me anymore. Even if it makes people think I'm a little bit difficult or a little bit crazy, whatever. I don't know. Actually, one big thing that actually kind of inspired this sermon for me was some words in a confession we're about to do together. And the words are, and it's, oh, it always punches me in the gut every time I read these words. <laughs> and in this confession, we confess the things that we have done and also the things that we've left undone. I've actually never led a confession before and I'm quite nervous. I told Will, I was like, am I allowed to? I've never done it. Um, and confession is something that's a little bit new for me because I grew up, because I became a Christian and went to a Pentecostal church and we never had like a very formal confession like this. And it's something I've been getting a lot of richness in my relationship with God and having this practice in my life. And it's not that we go before him just saying, oh, we're so awful. And it's not a time that's meant to make us feel shame, but rather actually being honest and confessing to God does the exact opposite. The things that would often make us feel shame, we're naming it and we're claiming it and we're saying, Jesus, we apologize for this and we surrender it to you. So yeah, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed and by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Thanks so much, Bria. That was so good to hear and to be reminded of Jesus, who is our peace and who's broken the walls of the dividing lines of hostility. It's so good to be reminded that we're one humanity in him and that Jesus gives us a new way. And the reason that we listen to talks and we do this stuff called church isn't just so that we can go back and live our lives normally, but it's so that we can be transformed and so see the world around us also transformed. So I'm going to leave a bit of space now and I want to encourage us all to dialogue with God about the things we've heard. Maybe what you've just heard has sparked different emotions. I just want to leave a space where we can do that with God. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your heart above everything else. We thank you for the way that you've reconciled us. You've become our peace. We thank you, Jesus, that we have access to the Father through you, no matter who we are and where we come from. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bring to mind things in our own hearts that we need to deal with before you. God, we recognise that you are our peace. And Lord, we haven't always lived in that peace. 
where we've been guilty or where we've been part of systems that are not of your kingdom. God, we're so sorry. And now, Lord, we just bring before you things that are on our minds that might have been brought about in that sermon we've just heard. God, we give them to you. And we ask, God, that we would see your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd give us courage to be those people who bring forth your kingdom. That when we see bits of the world that aren't of your kingdom, that we'd have the courage to call it out. Jesus, you broke the walls of hostility that divide people. Well, we've been part of systems or part of individuals that, that build up those walls of hostility. We're so sorry, God. Would you bring to mind, God, the things that we've done that play a part in that now? And I want to thank you that as citizens of your kingdom, we have responsibilities that go beyond race and beyond what we look like, beyond people that we know or we are around often. We have the responsibility to people of all different races as, as those who bear your image. And God, we cry out for people across the world now who are in dire situations. We cry out for the people in the Yemen or in, in places where there's huge persecution or famine or disease. And God, we ask for your transformation for them. God, I pray that you'd give us eyes to see people as you see them. Jesus, would you lift our eyes to you? Help us to focus on you, who's the answer to this hurting world. And Lord, I pray that you'd bring to mind things that we should do to, to be part of your kingdom now. Whether that's in our workplace or our family or our friends. Would you bring that to mind now, Lord? So, Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to partner with you to see the transformation of all things. In your name, Jesus. Amen.
Jesus, thank you for the way you've met with us this morning. And I just pray that you will use today to begin to provoke things in us, whether from points of disagreement or agreement, Lord, that you will just speak to us about what's going on in our hearts when it comes to this issue of race. Lord, I pray that you will just open us up, reform us, reshape us as individuals and as a church to live in your world more as you have created us to live and to live out a vision of of your kingdom for all to see, I pray. Amen. So good to have you with us. Um, Thank you for joining us. Do stay around um, and join us on the kind of Zoom uh, for a kind of post-church Zoom chat if you're available. Um, But I hope you have an amazing week and we will see you in just a short while. Bye.